Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. Um, it's a pleasure because it's my first time actually giving an in-person conference almost uh, after 19 months. So I, I think it's time for me to thank the organizer of this, uh, of this uh, conference, particularly Lori for putting everything together. Really appreciate it, gathering these folks together to do this. So I truly appreciate it. So today I'll be, my name is Ali Jahangir. I'm the senior principal engineer at Janssen Pharmaceutical in uh, Springhouse, uh, um, in Pennsylvania. And we are in the business of uh, device quality and uh, in combination product and several emerging technologies. So we're working with a lot of the devices that as Mira has alluded to from auto injectors to transdermal patches to sprays, cell delivery, gene therapies, et cetera, et cetera. But today my talk is essentially focused on application of computational modeling and simulation in combination product in particular. So let me start my presentation by just showing you a very revealing uh, graph, which essentially represents the largest um, technological transformation in human history. So it starts somewhere between from um, late 1700. And you can see that in, um, let me actually I should get back here. Can we go back to this? So it essentially shows you that in late 1800, we're beginning to see the emergence of three main technology platform of telephone, automobile, and electricity. And when this came out, I think this was phenomenal and revolutionary. It was phenomenal and revolutionary from the point of view that the productivity essentially exploded because of um, lower cost, and the demand across sectors just became unbelievable. It was totally unleashed. Fast forward another 120 years, and we are where we are right now. So we are talking about five or six different technology platforms that is truly changing the global economy and the way we're looking at devices and in several um, industries that we're talking about. We're talking about energy storage, artificial intelligence, robotic, um, genome sequencing, and blockchain, uh, blockchain um, uh, technologies. And hidden there, there's a little bit of um, analyti data analytics and computational modeling that we're talking about. Now, the relevance of this particular uh, field to our industry is the fact that um, companies are able to sort of embrace this sort of data, advanced data analytics and computational modeling in order to improve their uh, products and the processes that are mainly, that become more agile, more efficient, and in a sense, um, more reliable. Now, the point is that the implication of that is that we're going to be able to improve things like um, design of our devices, the, the quality and compliance, as, um, as we know, was talking about patient centricity, HCT, HCP centricity, um, making better insights, making better decisions, and ultimately in, the, in, a, in a far um, you know, cheaper uh, price. And these innovations will continue to multiply. So I think as industry, we really need to be ready for this sort of wave of uh, um, technological advances that are coming our way. Now, you might think that computational modeling is in embryonic stage in several fields. But believe it or not, uh, there are other high-risk industries that have already embraced this uh, technology. And those are the technology that billions of people across the world are using to transport themselves. For example, in the case of automotives, uh, car manufacturers simulate car crash tests and they use it um, with real car primarily for the validation enhancement of computer models. And other ones is actually uh, aerospace. I mean, almost entire characterize, uh, you know, um, characteriz characterization of a flight or a design of a flight is done through computational modeling and simulation. I think we can do better with our auto injectors. So, the fact remains that the farm and med device industries essentially lag uh, other major high uh, industries in the use of CM, uh, CMNS or computational modeling and simulation. And the reason really is why. And what looms large on top of our industry is the question of trust. Our researchers, our engineers, our regulators are all questioning, can we really rely on this computational modeling tool that you guys are bringing in? And as I'm going to be talking about this a little bit more, I'm going to show you that there's a multi-pronged approach going on and there's an initiative, from at least from a regulator side, to improve this trust element. 
In, in med devices, we essentially rely on build it and test it paradigm. In other words, we built a, a prototype, we built uh, a device, and then we test it. We test it on a bench, we test it in animals, we test it in clinical trials. And once we've sort of gained certain uh, certitude and uh, confidence that they are safe and functional, then we submit that to our regulatory bodies and they're able to uh, give us the green light to proceed. But we all know that that approach has its limitation. And we're beginning to see the opening of the door to kind of um, the computational modeling and simulation that we're using. And at Janssen, we have started doing that. In fact, our three divisions in medical devices, pharmaceuticals, and consumers, we are actually collaborating um, inter-franchise to sort of enable that technology uh, within Janssen. Now, in my view, reimagining this future of this technology can be built on some kind of a technological framework. And what I'm gonna show you here are those five technological frameworks. So one is the question of patient and healthcare professional centricity when it comes to design. Um, thinking, um, you know, in incorporating end-to-end -end from program design to execution and approval and, uh, and the launch. The other one is the relays uh, in the area of process uh, redesign, both cross-functionally and within R&D, um, that improves speed of development and builds research insight. The next two are indeed the area that I'm focusing on on digital technology enablement that allows automation of highly repetitive processes and alongside the generation of new insights and data and uh, advancement of analytics or and in, a case, in, in our case predictive modeling informed through internal and external data sources that improves decision making and quality and speed. And finally, agile way of working with working model optimized for speed and decision making across portfolio. This particular framework didn't come right out of uh, um, you know, thin air. This is actually based on several years of best practices. In fact, came out of a McKinsey paper that they're talking about how industries can adopt this sort of approach and basically make computational modeling a very effective tool as opposed to something, a fad that comes and goes. And I'm gonna show you that it's not gonna be a fad because FDA is actually requesting it. And speaking of that, let me just show you some of the emerging technologies that has so far been used in our space. So we're talking about artificial intelligence, in silico modeling, industry 4.0, deep learning, machine learning, advanced analytics, uh, modeling and simulation, of course, um, the digital transformation, uh, virtual reality, uh, generative design, et cetera, et cetera. Now it's a kind of a pull and push kind of situation because if you look at it, some of the examples that we've had, it includes the virtual development through predictive modeling and simulation, real-time manufacturing data through sensors, technology partnerships with other companies and explore um, artificial uh, intelligence in development and other, other things that we're interested in. Now clearly in order to push this ball forward, we, ask, well, we should get all these mo um, stakeholders aligned. And the most important stakeholder in this case is probably, one of the most important stakeholders, is probably the regulatory bodies. And there are some promising signs from 2010. And the fact that FDA has ramping up the number of guidance, is ramping up the presentations, and they started defining at least what this thing should be. So they defined it as, com um, as a, a computational modeling as a process of representing a real world system by means of computer and running the simulation by implementing a numerical scheme. Dr. Tina Morrison from FDA is very much, if you guys look, him, uh, look her up, you can actually see a lot of publication from Tina Morrison on, 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 in this area. So modeling and simulation is the use of physical or logical representation of a given system to generate data and help determine decisions or make predictors, predictions sorry, about the system. Now, the kind of um, computational modeling simulation that I'm talking about, it's basically two kinds. There's an empirical modeling and there's a, uh, essentially a mechanistic modeling. The empirical modeling, as the name implies, it relies on statistical data. It doesn't rely on theory. Whereas mechanistic models, 
essentially uh, tries to come up with a math mathematical relationships for mechanical, chemical, fluid, and thermal uh, phenomena that we're seeing. Okay, now um, over the past few years, I would say past decade, there has been a push of using a lot of this mechanistic model, but more multi-physics model, because the multi-physics model allows you to combine everything that I just mentioned, you know, mechanical, chemical, uh, biological, fluid uh, models together that would probably be very fit to duplicate the complex biological system. So if you're injecting something into, into somebody's skin, you can't just rely on one kind of modeling, but it's a combination of all of it. And this multi-physics model will allow you to, to sort of do that. This is coming right out of one of the Tina Morrison's paper that the way um, FDA is seeing that um, MNS or um, modeling and simulation can revolutionize our field is some of the examples that are shown here. So simulate with big data, um, simulate the device, which one, there are, I don't know if I can see it. Uh, simulate the anatomy, simulate the physiology, chemical toxicology, this is a um, um, the simulating 3D printed devices, simulating um, another device in the heart, simulating Im uh, simulation embedded in a device, and some other things that can be done. So FDA is really looking at this in a very promising things uh, in the future, and that companies can essentially encourages them to submit their validation data instead of just doing empirically through models. So in summary, I think CMS offers uh, the following advantages. Shorter time to market, lower cost, safer devices, and less uh, uh, um, ethical issues as a result of animal testing and clinical investigation. And that is a conundrum here. So the whole paradigm of data generation and the information generation essentially falls into four or five different categories. So you can actually have a bench testing, you can have animal testing, you can have clinical trials, which reuses human, and that little small piece that is currently used is computer. This picture is from FDA, and FDA is telling you that in the next few years, I want more data coming in. I don't mean more data, different kind of data coming in that relies heavily on virtual and computer data. So less animal, less human, and let's work on, uh, let's uh, get the industry excited about putting the, those things together. Obviously, let me get into a little bit more details as how the, um, uh, I guess, the regulatory bodies are viewing this computational modeling and simulations. So in Europe, there are two major, um, I guess, laws, MDR, medical device uh, re regulations, and IVDR, which are in vitro, uh, um, diagnostic device regulations. I mean, I, I think most companies were uh, uh, scrambling to actually get these things done because MDR just became um, active in 2020 and the two years later, IVDR will come um, very, very active and everybody has to follow that. But the problem is that when you actually zoom in and hone into computational modeling and simulation, there's a very little, um, by the way, of instructing the manufacturers or the users of how to submit what. And I basically um, brought up those examples on these uh, various annexes that we have in, 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 in MDR. So in Annex 10.1a, it says, where appropriate, the result of biophysical or modeling research, uh, the validity of which has been demonstrated beforehand. And the other annex says, the result of tests such as engineering, laboratory, simulated use of animal tests, and the last one says the preclinical testing, for example, laboratory testing, simulated use testing, computer modeling, the use of animals. So you can tell you can tell that this is not they haven't really thought about this yet, and it gets a little bit better because if you actually look at the ISO 13485, uh, sorry, 13485, yeah, um, it provides slightly more instruction. But I think as far as I can safely say, and I can safely see because we're in the US, US, EU is in trouble when it comes to that kind of issues. They're kind of lagging behind. On the other hand, if you look at the FDA, so in 2010, Congress essentially mandated FDA to, to regulate 
computational modeling and simulations. And in 2011, FDA got to work and they published this document that you see in front of you, Advancing Regulatory Science and FDA, which actually essentially says, use and um, develop computational methods and in silico modeling. Excellent document to review for your, uh, before you go to bed. I'm just kidding. Um, in 2016, they released a guidance document, uh, reporting of computational modeling studies and medical device submissions. And this has been our Bible over the past few years at Janssen. What is it that they're looking for? And of course, uh, one, of the one of Tina's publications that actually really get to the nitty gritty details of what should computational modeling and simulation to be all about. Now, FDA has been doing all this in collaboration with other organizations, in particular ASME, American Society of Mechanical Engineering. And what they've done is that they've used their weight and they've used their name to gather who's who of medical devices as part of this committee to exactly answer the question that I um, uh, presented to you in my third slide, question of trust. How do we trust this data? How do we verify and how do we validate? And I think they brought the who's who of medical devices to basically answer that question. The result of this collaboration is essentially a, a working committee that put together a charter. And the charter essentially says to coordinate, promote, foster the development of standard that provide procedure for assessing and qualifying the accuracy and credibility of computational models and simulation. Responding exactly to the question that industry has asked. And they are actually divided into five subcommittees, um, VNV10, VNV20, VNV30, VNV40, and VNV50, and each deals with different areas of uh, um, computational modeling. So first one is solid computational mechanics, uh, fluid dynamics is the second one, um, nuclear system and thermal fluid behavior. The ones that we're working on is the computational modeling for medical devices and also computational modeling for advanced manufacturing. Janssen is quite active in between 40 and 50 because those are the area of interest that we have. And then the need for credibility, obviously, is quite critical. To fully leverage computational modeling and simulation of the medical devices, we need a methodology to ensure credibility. And they define what the credibility should be. So they define credibility as um, trust obtained through the collection of evidence and the predictive capability of computational model for a, con for a context of use. And in 2018, they actually released this really uh, useful document. So let me just walk you through this. So the guide that I just show you is, um, does not discuss how to perform VNV, okay? It provides that, uh, um, the framework essentially guides the analyst through the risk-informed credibility assessment, um, which helps to how much VNV is necessary to prove that your data is sufficient and that it doesn't cause any kind of uh, concern when it comes to safety to your patient. It's a very risk-based approach. They further go into a little bit more detail and provide this stepwise, um, I guess, vision of how to do it. So the first one is to formulating the question of interest, describing the context of use, analyzing the risks, and establishing the credibility goal. And essentially answering the questions of verification, did you solve the underlying mathematical model correctly? Validation, does the underlying mathematical model correctly represent the reality of interest? And I'm just gonna get to the bottom, the credibility based on the available evidence is there, a, is there a belief in the predictive capability of computational model and the, for the context of use? So now that I provided you with a little bit of a background as to how are things happening from a regulatory perspective, from, from um, industry perspective, let me present to you some of the work that has been done um, out in, the, you know, in, an, in a non-industrial setting. And, Obviously, I'm not able to share with you some of the works that we're doing in Janssen, but let's just say that we're inspired by these publications. So they're, they're quite reliable. And um, I'm gonna give you two examples of a mechanistic and empirical um, modeling work that was done on an auto injector. 
and to tell you how the data can be actually aligned and, and harmonized. So just before I get into that, I mean, we, all, we are all familiar with auto-injectors. Um, so auto-injectors market has significantly grown due to the increasing need for self-administration of pharmaceutical products such as monoclonal antibodies. And as Asmita mentioned, what's important about these monoclonal antibodies is the viscosity and the volume that comes with it. And the auto-injector would um, allow the patients to actually inject these medication at the convenience of, uh, of their home. Um, Spring-driven spring auto-injectors have become the most popular type of auto-injectors as they're relatively straightforward um, to design, manufacture, compared to the other driving mechanisms. And one of the key performances that everybody's trying to, uh, uh, I guess, model is the question of injection time. So the objective of these two uh, work that I'm going to explain to you very briefly is that to construct a mathematical model that predicts the injection times of an auto-injector taking into account all the appropriate inputs um, and their associated variability. So this is the one that's going to discuss um, the uh, mechanistic model. And I was told, I mean, there are a whole bunch of formula that I could have put in here, but I was told by Every time I put a differential equation there, I'm going to lose 25% of my, of my audience. So I decided not to put any formula here. So these are essentially the, uh, um, the, the forces that are relevant to an auto-injector and uh, injection, uh, injection time. So the first one that you see up there is essentially the forces that are working on the spring and the rod. This is on, um, uh, I guess, the plunger. This is the... Uh, um, barrel of the syringe, okay? And as I said, there are really complicated differential equations there, but I'm not going to just take my word for it. So when they run this analysis and they did um, plunger displacement versus syringe displacement, you can see that there are dotted line and there's a solid line. And you can see those two lines are superimposed on top of one another. What that indicates is that you have, um, there's a modeling error of 3%. But in general, you're, they were able to model the system quite well. The next one, whoops, sorry. The next one is essentially syringe barrel displacement. Now, the red line displays the experimental empirical work that we've done, and the blue line um, demonstrates the modeling work. And you can see the deviation is a little bit out there. It's about 20%. But when you take the all data together and you basically compare the experiment versus the modeling, you can see there's a, almost a um, um, pretty decent alignment between, between the two measurements. Now, that error there is about 20%, 20, 21%. So the model predicted well that the injection time increases with the uh, volume and viscosity of the drug product solution, but decreases in spring far, uh, force as expected and reported in the literature. So these are baby steps that we're taking. The baby steps that we need to do in order to move to the next uh, large levels. Now this next model is the mechanistic one that they've used um, statistical method to get to the same conclusion. Again, the forces that are relevant to injection times includes the spring friction, the fluidic force, and the plunger force. And when you actually put it all together, this is the picture of uh, um, basically how a stopper friction model functions. So the one on the uh, left-hand side is your measured. The one on your right-hand side is your model. And you can see that there's a pretty decent linearity be between the two going on. And again, when you actually look at the model versus the measured, this one has even a better um, alignment and linearity, which essentially indicates that you don't have to go through a whole bunch of complicated, sexy differential equation. You can just rely on good old statistical method to get there. All right, so that was really, I mean, I could have spent a lot of time on that slide, but I thought to just give you a little bit of flavor of how things are happening. Now, let me talk to you about some of the challenges that we have in this, in this space. We have shortage of experts. In fact, Experts capable of developing computer models and simulating medical devices are indeed rare and difficult to find. Regulatory dilemma, dilemma as I've mentioned, particularly when it comes to uncertainties in Europe, um, 
and, and notified bodies are not driving the regulatory science forward toward the same extent as we're doing it in the US. This has to be a more global approach, if you will. And the high cost of the tools. So if you want to lay down uh, basic modeling um, infrastructure, that initial investment is actually kind of high, but I think it's going to pay over, over time. And finally, time required to develop and validate these models, which is about one to two years. So in summary, um, the recent pandemic has reinforced the need for agility, speed to market, and intensify cost-cutting pressures in both pharma and medical device um, development and manufacturing. Similarly, the application of new emerging digital technologies in creating, managing, and analyzing a significant amount of data will inevitably continue to transfer of these industries. And manufacturers that utilize this suitable advanced analytics and other effective digital technologies are much better are in much better position to outperform the competitors and guide the regulatory pathways and maximize commercialization opportunities at lower price point and faster deliveries. And of course, I've mentioned that in um, a review in literature essentially indicates that there are CMNS capabilities that are possible to do on various drug delivery platforms, both at a component level and at the system level. And with the support of our regulatory agencies in improving the trust in data factor among manufacturers, such as um, the academic practices that I just um, alluded to, um, needs to be adopted by medical device and pharma industries, resulting in enhancement of um, patient and HCP experience, better insight and decision-making capabilities, and reduction in development uh, costs. With that, uh, I thank you for your attention.